Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's call with LNI Secretary Jerry Alexiak and UC Benefits Policy Director Susan Dickinson. I'm Teresa Elliott, Deputy Communications Director for LNI. Please submit your questions by clicking the chat icon located in the lower right hand corner of your screen. Please include your name and media outlet, followed by your question. In the interest of time, you'll be limited to one question, but time permitting, we'll open up the call for a second round. You may submit any additional follow-up questions to us at dlipress at pa.gov, and we'll address them after the call. For your awareness, this call is being recorded. If you do not consent to being recorded, please hang up now. Following the call, a link to the recording will be provided to the media outlets that participated today. We'll get started with comments from Secretary Jerry Alexiak. Secretary? Thank you, Teresa, Susan, and uh, thanks to all of you who have joined us this afternoon. I'm going to start with the numbers as we do. Uh, since March 15th, we've now paid out more than $30.5 billion in unemployment compensation benefits. That's $5.8 billion from our regular UC system. Uh, the remainder, uh, about $25 billion, is uh, from uh, the CARES Act and from both the Pennsylvania and the federal extended benefits program. We've, uh, and that also includes $1.7 billion from our lost wages assistance uh, program. <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. Since, <coughs> since March 15th, we've increased our UC uh, service center staffing levels by over 180%, uh, going from 775 employees to our current total of 2,199 employees. And they have worked almost 400,000 uh, total overtime hours, 396,815 hours. Uh, they've been very busy and we appreciate their efforts. 97% uh, of eligible claimants who filed for regular unemployment between March 15th and October 3rd were either paid or were deemed not eligible for benefits. The remaining 3% uh, continues through the adjudication process. That number is uh, going down every week as our the dates that we have covered uh, uh, are extended. Since March 15th, we have helped uh, well over 3 million of our fellow citizens through email, through our phone system, through live chat, and over a million through our virtual assistant. Uh, right now, our call and chat wait times are still higher than we'd like them to be, and some claimants are still experiencing difficulty getting through, especially on our busiest days. We encourage claimants trying to reach us via phone to call us later in the week, specifically on Thursdays or Fridays, when our call volume is lower. We are expanding our capacity and expect to be able to answer 8,000 calls and respond to 11,000 emails daily by the end of this calendar year. We're also making steady progress with adjudications, backdating claims, and benefits related fraud. Those numbers uh, uh, are of um, backlogs in all those areas are going down and, and that uh, we believe that, that is clearly a testament to the hard work of the, the dedicated public servants within our system and a reflection of, of our commitment, which we have had from the very beginning to get claimants the benefits they deserve. And as frustrating as it can still be for some people, more and more of our fellow citizens are getting those benefits and we will continue that effort. Um, we announced at the end of last week that LNI was expanding our ability to backdate UC claims from six weeks to up to 52 weeks. This change uh, went into effect on Saturday and it will allow LNI staff to assist claimants who attempted to file UC claims during the first weeks of the pandemic but needed to be helped and were unable to reach a staff member due to the sudden and historic surge in claims that we experienced. We are committed to getting every eligible unemployment compensation claimant the money they are owed. And expanding our backdating ability will ensure that no eligible claimant will lose out on payments because of the hardships caused by this pandemic. Claimants to seeking, a, uh, seeking to file a backdated claim should email uchelp at pa.gov. That's uchelp at pa.gov with the subject line backdate request. The email should include the exact date they were separated from their employer and any relevant information about the separation for the additional weeks 
they wish to claim. Due to the anticipated high volume of initial backdating requests, claimants may experience a delay in receiving a response. They should send only one email request as they will be processed as fast as possible and multiple requests will only clog the system and will delay UC's ability to process claims in a timely manner. Let me give you a brief update on the Lost Wages Assistance Program. Uh, that's the extra $300 per week for the weeks August 1st through September 5th. Um, the federal government will not be allocating any further dollars for that, um, but we uh, still have funding available in our initial grant, and we encourage anyone who thinks they are eligible for benefits to go to uc.pa.gov slash cert, and they can get the information they need to file. In our trust fund, uh, as of uh, Friday, November 6th, uh, the balance was about $222 million in the trust fund based on the official updates provided by the U.S. Treasury. It's actually $221,553,270. Uh, so far, as of, again, November 6th, we've borrowed $618 million in zero interest loans. And we plan to borrow uh, 300 million this month and up to 700 million in each of December and January. And this will ensure that we have the funding we need to continue making our UC payments. Um, our virtual town halls, uh, we will be holding uh, two more virtual town halls for the public to allow them to ask questions directly of uh, Susan and myself. So far, we've held 24 town halls. The 25th is scheduled for this Thursday, and we anticipate our uh, last town hall being held on Thursday, November 19th. And uh, we're going to suspend those um, this month for several reasons, including uh, we're continuing to make excellent progress with UC. We've seen a drop in the number of claimants participating in the town halls as well. And uh, we will be reevaluating this early in 2021 to see if we will continue be picking those up again and continuing those, but we are going to be taking a break uh, basically through the holiday season. Um, we encourage uh, people who want to be a part of the remaining town halls to go to access.live slash PA labor to be a part of that uh, program. Um, let me give you an update as we do each week on uh, the fraud ID me to uh, let you know how, uh, how that's going across uh, our Commonwealth. It's important, as we always say, to re, uh, for claimants to remain vigilant against fraud and recognize the warning signs. Over the past several weeks, we've announced new attempts by fraudsters to steal information or unemployment benefits from claimants. Every time we suspect a new scheme, we immediately take the necessary action to block fraud and protect claimants uh, with our vendor and our system and with uh, other appropriate agencies. We have recently noticed an influx of PIN reset requests. And while claimants legitimately need to reset their PIN from time to time, this sudden surge came alongside requests to also change the address that the new PIN should be sent to. And this is uh, a red flag for us. Uh, we strongly suspect that this is a new scheme by fraudsters to redirect the reset PINs to mailing addresses where they can gain access. If successful, the scheme effectively blocks legitimate claimants out of their accounts, which is particularly frustrating because these are clearly the people that deserve and need those benefits, and it will provide fraudsters with full access. So to protect claimants and to prevent this latest fraud scheme, LNI is now only sending pin change requests to the original address from which the claimant filed their claim. If a claimant needs to change both their pin and their address, they must contact the service center at 888-313-7284. That's 888-313-7284 to provide additional identity verification. Uh, as we've said all along on these calls, we are always asking claimants to be on high alert and to always guard their personal information. Uh, agents of LNI will not ask for your username or your password, you should never give that to anyone. We'll also never ask for a full social security number. We uh, work with the last four digits. Um, we, I know, and I'm sure many of you know from personal experience that when you get these calls, the, 
the scammers can uh, sound very helpful, uh, act like they are, genuinely care, when really what they want to do is steal. So we will continue working with our state and federal law enforcement partners to prevent fraud and scams. Uh, we encourage you to go to uc.pa.gov to find more information about the warning signs and what you can do if you think you have been a victim of, of fraud or if you have gotten benefits that uh, you were not entitled to. Uh, with that being said, we'll now turn the remaining time over to, uh, to all of you to ask Susan and I questions. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Secretary Alexiak. We're now moving into the Q&A portion of today's call. If you have any questions for either Susan or Secretary Alexiak, please submit them now using the chat icon located at the bottom lower right-hand side of your screen. Please make sure to include your name as well as your media outlet with your question. Our first one today comes in from Paul Van Alstal from WTAE. One claimant has been waiting for a response for his appeal since June. His three questions are, why is it taking so long? What is the average wait time for appeals? And what is being done to expedite appeals? So if um, someone's been waiting since June, that tells me it probably isn't an actual appeal. Uh, there are different paths that any type of, of disagreement can take. And one of them is a traditional appeal which means that someone was determined ineligible and they want to you know, hear, have that heard by a referee and want that to be resolved. Um, a lot of times an individual, if they want to appeal their financial information, that's not, it doesn't go down the regular appeal path. It actually just goes back to the service center to be processed um, to you know, look at what the financial issue is and then change the financial. Um, I have a, a feeling just because of the, the timing um, that that might be a PUA financial um, only because we've had a lot of those and there's a lot of misunderstandings with claimants about how it works uh, when it comes to PUA financial eligibility. There really is no time limit other than the end of the program in December to make changes. Um, if uh, you know, we, get, we receive information um, that we didn't prior, didn't receive prior to that we can adjust someone's financial information to give them the additional uh, benefits that they're looking for. Um, a lot of times though, we're finding individuals think that they've provided what they needed to and they have not. So we cannot raise their weekly benefit rate as they would like. Um, so I, I realize it's a very you know general type of um, um, information, but typically that that's what we see. Uh, financial information on regular unemployment usually has to do with eligibility for benefits, um, and that takes a shorter time frame, whereas PUA eligibility, um, that can fluctuate depending on what the person has given us and what they haven't given us. Um, and if it is a, a traditional type of appeal that this person is talking about, um, I, and I'm, I'm thinking it's not because um, the appeals board was actually very caught up on everything, um, and it was it was really only taking, you know, two weeks to hear something at first, and and then a couple of weeks for the actual schedule to to have have the hearing. Um, so anyway, they they those have been going through, and there really wasn't a large backlog of real appeals. Um, it's mostly in the monetary appeals, especially PUA appeals, where they uh, have been taking more time just to straighten those out. Um, and the individuals do, do have until you know the end of of December to uh, you know provide any information that they may not have previously provided. You know, a common occurrence that we see is individuals provide proof of wages, but they don't provide proof of net wages. They provide gross wages and we can't use gross wages. It has to be net wages. So that's an issue that we go back and forth with claimants on a lot um, just to make sure that we get the appropriate documents. Thank you, Susan. Next, Lauren Rosenblatt from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette asks, can you share exactly how much money the state has paid out through the PUA and the PEUC programs? Also, can you talk about the impact if those programs do expire at the end of December? Well, I can let the, I'll answer the second part of that question first. Clearly, when they expire and those benefits are, are no longer there, um, that, that's going to have a, a serious uh, impact on the um, people of, of Pennsylvania, that this has been a lifeline for many of them. We have advocated um, for quite some time for an, some kind of an extension 
of the CARES Act. We know the HEROES Act was passed in, in the uh, House of Representatives, but has not been addressed by the Senate. Uh, so they're, they're, it, it will be very, very difficult for our fellow citizens uh, when those programs end. And we uh, are uh, looking forward to working uh, with the uh, new administration in Washington uh, when they come in to uh, make sure that we can get something done for uh, not just the citizens of Pennsylvania, but citizens across the country that are uh, will be impacted when these these uh, programs end. Susan, you want to speak to the numbers if you have it? Um, sure. For PUA, uh, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, we've paid out $6.1 billion. That's a billion with a B. And for PEUC, it is $637.8 million so far. Next, we have Peter Hall from Allentown Morning Call. The backdating period is going from six weeks to 52 weeks, correct? And do you know how many potential claimants may have missed out on benefit weeks due to the inability to backdate further? Well, we don't know the, the total number of individuals who may still be trying to reach us simply because they haven't reached us yet, which is you know the point of, of giving 52 whole weeks back. Uh, of course, at this point, it wouldn't be any weeks prior to March. I mean, that was, of course, the beginning of when all the pandemic uh, activities began. So uh, we don't have an estimate on those, uh, you know, number of individuals. Um, but of course, once they do get a hold of us, it will make it a lot simpler for us to be able to backdate them because previously our regulation has a six week limit on if someone can't get a hold of us because of our phone lines being busy and they can't reach us in any way. Um, so of course, that was uh, actually new back in the Great Recession and six weeks uh, made sense at the time then, but now, uh, you know, that, that, you know, is the amount of claims that we have is back in the Great Recession, a, a golf ball compared to the beach ball that we have now of, of number of claims. So um, of course we needed something different and new in order to accommodate what we're seeing now. So, uh, you know, hopefully that gives comfort to individuals who may not have been able to reach us on time and they can reach us now, or if they had previously reached us and we had to, uh, you know, not pay some of the older weeks because of the way our regulations are, now we would be able to go back and do that. So, uh, you know, hopefully that helps people out. Of course, it wasn't their fault that they couldn't reach us. Um, you know, we have a very large volume of claims that we're going through and now they'll be able to be made whole and get the benefits that they would have otherwise received if they'd been able to, to get a hold of us. Okay, it looks like we are now entering our second round of questions. So I encourage anyone who has not submitted any questions to this point to please do so now. Uh, the next question is a follow-up with some additional information to the first question. Um, Susan, I think this one was directed at mm -hmm. you. It's in reference to the claimant who has been waiting for a response to his appeal since June. The additional information we received is it is a traditional claim and he has requested a referee. Do you have anything additional to add to that response, Susan, with this new information? Um, no, nothing additional other than I, I do know the appeals office is still on time with everything. So depending on the timing of, of when that was requested and what the actual circumstances are, that probably has a lot to do with it. it, it you know, it's hard to comment on individual circumstances because, of course, every claim is different. Uh, the timing, the communications, everything is different. Uh, but in general, the referees' offices are caught up right now. Um, and I know that they are looking to add additional referees assuming that there will be more appeals coming, um, especially with Ernst & Young helping us get through our um, all of our adjudication issues that we have to get through, uh, and that'll be done faster. So they expect more appeals to be coming down the pike and are preparing for it, um, but as of right now, they are in good shape. And here's another question from Lauren Rosenblatt from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Following up on my earlier question, you mentioned you look forward to working with the new administration when they come in. What happens during the month of January? Are you optimistic there will be any short-term measures put in place to temporarily extend the programs? Well, I am always optimistic, but I can tell you I'm not real optimistic about um, uh, the current uh, makeup of Congress and the administration doing anything to, to help anytime soon. They have been at it for quite some time and have made no progress. We continue to work with our a delegation in the House and with our senators uh, at the federal level to um, get something done. 
Uh, if, it, if they could get it done, that would be great. If not, then we will continue to work with the current administration, the new administration, anybody that will listen to get people the benefits they need. Uh, I think that question about what will happen should really be directed to uh, our representatives in Congress and in the Senate and to the um, those who are uh, negotiating that that deal at the at the federal level. Um, we need some we we the collective we those of uh, the citizens of Pennsylvania need help, and the sooner we can get it, the better it will be for everyone, and the better it will be for our economy, uh, not just those individual people, but getting people uh, to, to you know back to work. Uh, we're moving in the right direction with our unemployment numbers dropping and. Uh, you know, we're seeing a resurgence of COVID. So there's a lot of uncertainty right now. And the more we can provide people the benefits that they need to continue, the help they need to continue, the better off it will be for all of us. Amy from WPXI asks, Pennsylvania delayed launch of the new unemployment system designed to change how people file. When will this new system launch and will it be easier to use for those applying? Well, I'll let Susan talk about the uh, system itself, but I can tell you that uh, I believe it's early next week. We have a, uh, we being the uh, uh, LNI has an, uh, a meeting with the uh, Benefits Modernization Advisory Committee. We worked with them and uh, the vendor and other adv advocacy groups to determine that it was best to wait. Uh, and um, that's what we have done. We will uh, have uh, more information as we. Um, move forward. We the, the process continues, and it continues uh, at a pace that uh, uh, we you know we're ha we're happy with and want to see uh, improved if, if even. So um, we don't have any definitive date right now. We may have some more information uh, when we meet with the Mem Benefits Modernization Advisory Committee. But even then, uh, uh, we're we're still in the midst of of the pandemic, and we will see uh, what's determined. Uh, Susan, I know you can speak about the ease of the system itself. Sure, and, and this system is very much like the PUA system that we've been using for several months now. Um, so it is in many ways easier to use. It consolidates a lot of different pieces together of our current unemployment system, which are kind of separate and, and don't really uh, communicate with each other. Um, it puts it all in one system. And on the customer's point of view, whether it be a claimant or an employer or a third party administrator, they're gonna have access to see a lot more information and do more things than they can do now. Uh, for example, filing an appeal um, will be really easy if they just you know, pull up which appeal it is that they wanna file and just hit the appeal button. Um, they provide some information about who should attend the appeal and then it's done. Uh, whereas right now, you know, they have to send a separate email. They have to wait for that to be processed. There's there's an entire workflow that happens in the system, which is going to make things a little faster. Um, but from a, you know, a customer standpoint, it's better to have more information than less information. And right now, our old system really doesn't have a dashboard type of style where you can go in and, and see a lot about your claim. You can see some things. You can see your most recent payments right now. Um, you can even change your PIN if you want to. But but there's, you know, full functionality in the new system. Of course, um, it, you know, I feel it will be easier, but that's once someone learns it. If they're used to the old system, it is going to be uh, a little different. You know, filing a new claim has more questions um, attached to it uh, just because of the way the product is set up. Um, you know, the, the continuing claims week to week, that should be fairly standard, about the same. Um, you know, there's just different things that they're going to have to discover if they're used to using our old system. Um, but once they get used to it, just like anything, you know, once you're past that learning curve, then uh, you can really appreciate how much it makes your life a little easier to be able to have all that information at your fingertips. Uh, you know, we, we mail so many things right now and in the future in their dashboard, everything that we mail them is is located there so they don't have to worry about retaining paper copies, not losing things. I mean, at any point they need to see anything we mailed to them and they can go in and do that. Um, sounds fairly simple. Sounds like something, you know, that other other places, banks, things like that have had for years. But, you know, finally we're able to come on board and we're able to offer that type of self-service that individuals don't have with our current system. And I think that will be the biggest win for our customers out of the project. And our last questions of the day are from Paul Van Alstal from WTAE. 
With LNI staff working long hours and lots of overtime, what steps have been taken to ensure that staff maintain good judgment? Are there any limits to individual overtime? There are limits to the hours. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was muted. I was muted. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll I'll begin, Susan, and then certainly you can. Sure. You can mm -hmm. uh, begin. I I was starting to say that that's a, a great question, and uh, we we are very concerned. We are watching very carefully uh, our staff. They they have done uh, just an amazing job, an outstanding job in responding to uh, the situation that we have have, uh, have been working through since March 15th. Um, we are watching. We want to make sure that they do maintain their own health and well-being, uh, that they uh, do maintain their their uh, judgment, that they are able to help the citizens of Pennsylvania. Um, we um, we respect that they uh, are putting in those hours, but again, we want to be careful uh, that that they uh, are taking care of themselves. Uh, Susan, you want to speak more to that? Uh, yes, I just wanted to add that there are um, limits on the hours that they can do things during the day simply because our mainframe system does have overnight processing that it does. So we limit, um, you know, we have to, uh, the system has to shut down at 10 o'clock each night to do some processing. Um, and then it comes back up at six o'clock in the morning. So there is downtime there that, uh, you know, the system just needs processing time. Um, and also on, on Saturdays, it has a bigger uh, batch run that it does for the whole week. Um, you know, outside of that, uh, we allow overtime, uh, you know, as much as individuals are interested. We do, if you remember, have a lot of contractors also working for us, a lot of contract companies that the U.S. Department of Labor has temporarily allowed us to use. So those individuals tend to have hours across the weekends and in evenings, and that's just their regular hours, and sometimes it is overtime, but that's all set by their actual employer. Um, and, you know, we encourage them to help us as much as possible. So, you know, across the board, there are plenty of hours uh, for overtime. It is, you know, up to the individual how much they want to work or how much they want to limit it. Uh, and then they, every individual is different. And with that, that's all the time we have for today. Please email our communications office at dlipress at pa.gov with additional questions. Thank you so much for joining us today and stay well. Thank you all. Thank you.